Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is the uh, this is the last of the regular GSC brown bags for the year, and I want to thank uh, Narayan Sastry and Dave Harding and Laura Nicholas, who did a great job as the committee organizing them all, and we're uh, ending in a in a flurry here with a great uh, great visitor. And I'll let Narayan I'm going to let Laura do the presentation. There will be a seminar joined with SRC by Jim Smith on uh, May 18th, so watch for that, but I'll let Laura do today's introduction. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. We're delighted to have Doug Allen from Columbia. We'll be talking about health capital and the prenatal environment for internal fasting during pregnancy, and so in addition to this paper, you've actually done lots of other important work on um, early life and in utero exposure that all be really interested in. Especially if we're in HRS, we're having a non-stop baby boom. And <laughs> the day we point that, you know, everyone should be thinking about these potential sources of exposure while we can. Well, <laughs> um, so the pressure's on. Um, the, um, yes. the child's <laughs> I work with Flash and Zumker. I have it. I'm supposed to stay back here. I know that. Okay. Uh, this is joint work with Flash and Zumker, and it uh, sort of fits into uh, a, um, a sort of set of things I've been working on on the fetal origins hypothesis. Uh, most people probably have a sense of what that is. I'll just go through it in one slide. Um, the fetal origins hypothesis basically says that um, uh, development is more sensitive when gro growth is more rapid. And as it turns out, uh, growth is especially rapid uh, in utero. And uh, as a result of this, the same health insult that's experienced uh, during pregnancy may have um, more persistent effects on health than something that's experienced, say, at age two or some, some later age. Uh, and um, for those of you versed with uh, the, um, the sort of Grossman model of health determination, this is, a, this is a departure from that view, which models health as a stock variable that responds to uh, you know, uh, net investments in each period, which would uh, otherwise say that uh, recent uh, health exposures may be uh, more important. Uh, uh, an additional sort of... Um, would, he, uh, would he agree with that? I would have thought, I mean, you certainly can think about that kind of stuff, right? Uh, yes. About child development and cognitive development in a, in a production question context. Yes. And it's just saying, you know, investments at different periods of time, you know, it depends on the nature of the production function when those investments are important. So it doesn't seem to me this is in any part, I mean, I don't see them in conflict. So, Most of my life, but I wouldn't. Um, I, I totally agree with you on that, on the Heckman production function concept. I, I, I love that. So if we, if, that, that sounds great to me. Um, yeah. But I guess I just don't see how it's, it's the, the Barbara hypothesis that contradicts the human capital production function of health model of those things. But you might say because the human capital model is so flexible, it can accommodate anything. <laughs> and therefore, it's statues. But I won't go there. OK. Uh, <laughs> and maybe I won't either, if that's all right. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Right. Right. Um, OK. This is only motivation. I this is all by way of motivation, and um, and actually we we Janet Curry and I have a have a chapter that's forthcoming in the Handbook of uh, Labor Economics that sort of talks about the sort of uh, Heckman style production function um, and sort of how it might be useful for interpreting this stuff, which is probably won't be any use to Heckman either. Uh, but but yes. Uh, okay. Uh, an additional uh, aspect that makes this sort of um, interesting uh, is that um, uh, Barker and others have argued that uh, many of these effects may be latent and not uh, manifest themselves at, until into adulthood. Uh, and um, as I just indicated, the person uh, in, in medicine and public who's most often associated with this hypothesis is DJ uh, Barker. So uh, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to bring a new natural experiment to address this question. Um, and that natural experiment is, is uh, Ramadan. Uh, Ramadan is uh, the month of fasting in Islam, and uh, the fast 
uh, is only required for the um, daylight hours, and it lasts for one lunar month. Uh, the key thing uh, for identification purposes, especially in the context of you know, a large literature finding strong seasonal effects uh, in health and in birth outcomes in particular, is that uh, Ramadan begins 11 days earlier each year. So uh, part of why this paper makes me feel a little bit better about myself is that I could never remember when Ramadan was. And I, I, and I think this is why. It's because it was moving um, sort of slowly. Uh, after 32 years, Ramadan completes one uh, seasonal circuit. Uh, and um, you know, in addition to the, the sort of natural experiment virtue of this, uh, several hundred million women uh, will fast each year. 75% uh, of Muslims were in utero during a Ramadan, just by virtue of a nine-month uh, you know, pregnancy on average. Uh, and uh, the vast majority of pregnant women actually do fast, uh, according to the survey evidence. And little uh, to nothing is known about the long-term effects of intermittent fasting. Yes? So, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that certain people exempted from the Ramadan, so if you're sick and pregnant with I'll come to that in just a second. Okay. So uh, in the fetal origins literature, uh, I think Janet Curry uh, summarizes this nicely, is uh, that recent studies uh, that have analyzed exogenous shocks caused by conditions outside the control of the mother provide uh, compelling evidence uh, in favor of the fetal origins hypothesis. Um, the second uh, bullet here is just sort of a point that Miller made from sort of science fiction. Uh, we're going to be looking at, at historical shocks of some kind. Uh, what's, what's nice about Ramadan is it's not a one-off shock. Okay, so uh, Ramadan, I think, right now is sort of late summer, early fall. So we'll, we'll be having that again in a few months. Uh, and, and, and obviously, a lot of people are, are Muslim. Uh, secondly, um, you know, people have looked at things like the Dutch famine or the 1918 flu. And, uh, you know, we probably already had reason to think that that was, you know, a, an event that should be avoided. Uh, and, uh, you know, to find out that there were long-term effects of that maybe are not so, so interesting. Uh, does this generalize to things that are more uh, common exposures? So this is the sort of killing me softly thing, which I, I proposed as a title that always gets killed, so I, I have to put it in slides instead. Um, the third thing is that, uh, uh, as was just raised, there may be this aspect of maternal discretion and whether uh, to observe uh, effects. Can I just ask a quick question sure. on motivation? Sure. So there, there have been a lot of studies on, on this hypothesis. Uh -huh. And we have a lot of information about, about the fact that um, in utero health can be a lot of settings. Yep. Um, so what are, the, what are the open questions? And so I, 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 can, I can understand some of these three new things, but why, why would we maybe be interested Okay, so I think uh, I would emphasize this one is the best evidence we have today, observationally, is from stuff that's very right. So if it was just confined to things that were really severe, and then we moved to sort of well-identified things that were less severe, and we didn't find anything, we might not care that much yeah. about the organs to sort of be this interesting thing, but not maybe something that we could one day think more towards uh, policy for, okay? So that's, that's the main thing that this, I think paper starts to speak to, but I but I think um, you asked sort of a broader question, uh, sort of, and, and a, part of what I heard, which was maybe not, uh, you know, just me being defensive, uh, is what as economists, what is it that, that we sort of you know stand to gain from something like this? And I think that's a that's a very um, interesting direction uh, for this literature, and in particular, what I think is really uh, an interesting direction, which I'm not going to say anything more about today, is. How, how do uh, parental investments interact with sort of the, the birthing endowment, okay? And, and when, we, when we see this, I mean, so I will say one more thing about it. When we do see long-term damage, um, it's, it's not necessarily the biological effect of this thing. It represents the, the interaction of that biological effect with whatever the sort of community or uh, parental response is to that damage. And there are different sort of sets of evidence that say, uh, some people tend to find that parents tend to um, compensate, like within family differences, and others say they reinforce. So, um, uh, you know, if, if you have one pregnancy that has a bad outcome, uh, sort of, uh, you know, 
mediating that is going to be whatever parents do. And I think that's a really nice place for economists to come in and say, say a lot. Because a, a lot of this is going to come back to a little bit of external validity of, of yep. Ramadan is, is a, a unique experience because individuals are, are, are in a certain setting. And in, in the public policy bay, if I could, you know, if we had a very good um, measure of what happens when women drink during pregnancy or women drink. Yep. These other things yep. that, are, that are speaking directly to public policy debates yep. versus, versus this one, which, you know, I, I don't know. So, so yes. I guess that's, that's something in the back of my mind. Is, sure. is, okay, so, so can I say two yeah. more things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one is, uh, I think something I also should have answered with is despite a lot of sort of um, rather involved sounding mechanisms, I don't think we have a good sense of the mechanisms, okay? Now, not, that's where I, I'm not sure that's the economist that's going to come up and say this is the exact right mechanism. But I think if, if we did have a really good sense of the mechanism, then we'd be more close to saying, what's the external validity of something like this? That said, um, I think some of the things we see look so similar to, to other things that um, uh, uh, epidemiologists think they have a good handle on the mechanism for, whereby I think we may think there is some external validity. And I think the chief thing uh, with that is going to be the, the sex ratio stuff. But, but um, basically, I, I, I'm taking all your points. OK. Um, actually, maybe I should talk about this slide. OK. Oh, no, I did. Great. OK. Uh, so I'm going to preview the findings. Uh, and uh, we have sort of two main batches of data. One is from uh, right here in Michigan, the natality data. Uh, and what we're going to find is that birth weight is lower for those with prenatal so, uh, By virtue of this timing, we can compare uh, uh, births where the parents are of Arab descent, uh, where the timing of the pregnancy overlaps with Ramadan versus those where Ramadan would have fallen shortly after the pregnancy. Those effects are, you know, consistently significant, but they're, you know, they're not huge. 40 to 50 grams is not very heavy. It's about, you know, a little over 1% of, of mean birth weight. Where we find much larger effects around the sex of the child, which I think is quite consistent with, um, with some earlier uh, and earlier and more recent work as well. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of, we, we will present some evidence on the sort of uh, identifying assumption here is that parents aren't timing their pregnancies to avoid uh, Ramadan, for example. Now we go to Uganda, and that may sort of seem like a bit, bit, of a, bit of a jump, and the reason for that is entirely a data, a data uh, reason. What we find for uh, Uganda, um, where we have uh, sort of a big census with um, uh, identification of who's uh, Muslim, who's not Muslim, and precise uh, information on when people are born, is that we find large effects on disability, uh, uh, particularly very early in pregnancy. Um, and again, uh, we don't sort of uh, have something that suggests that there's uh, selection in the timing of births, and we don't find any effects for non-Muslims. So there's no funky seasonality that we can, that we can uh, detect. Um, and then, uh, I'm not sure I'll get to this, but uh, uh, the Iraq census recently came out for 1997, um, and we can, we can uh, show very similar results in that. The USA data, you know, we're sort of more interested in the US, but unfortunately, the lack of precise information on when people are born uh, in the sort of public use data um, uh, restricts what we can do despite our great interest in that question. Okay, so uh, the rest of the presentation, I'll do uh, a little bit of background on Ramadan and, and the question of um, exemptions uh, and a very brief review, review of the medical literature on the subject, uh, data, results, and then some future work. Okay, so Ramadan is one of the five pillars of Islam, and you may be familiar with some of these others, like uh, the Hajj uh, pilgrimage. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, Ramadan is the name of the ninth lunar uh, month and it's designated for fasting. All healthy the adults are encouraged to abstain from eating and drinking and sex during daylight hours. And so we can flip to the uh, Penguin Classics translation of the Quran, uh, which, which mentions the, um, the, uh, the fasting, uh, but also um, the exemptions. If any of you is ill or on a journey, let them fast a similar, similar number of days uh, later on, okay? So uh, exemptions, as they've been interpreted, are for uh, sick people, uh, ill people, sorry, ill people, travelers, uh, elderly, and uh, prepubescent children, um, women who are menstruating or recently gave birth, 
are apparently given uh, somewhat more mixed messages, uh, including the swim court breastfeeding, um, and this may relate to the ritual purity of, of fasting. Um, and uh, something that's noted sort of throughout these discussions of uh, adherence to the fast is that uh, in making up the fast later on, that's often viewed as more of a hardship than a relief because you're doing the fast by yourself. And sort of the nice part about the fast is, is you know, sort of a communal aspect. So pregnant women are not automatically exempted. In, in many places, you know, Singapore being one, uh, it's interpreted that women, pregnant women are required to fast. Um, in certain places, uh, you can get an exemption uh, depending on the interpretation. Uh, but even still, uh, those days must be made up uh, later on. So, um, so survey evidence um, suggests that fasting during pregnancy is very common, and this is not restricted to uh, just developing countries. There's a study from uh, England, uh, a large sample one, that said 75% of women fasted during pregnancy and in Michigan. This is a small sample one, 88% um, uh, of women uh, reported fasting during pregnancy. In all of these numbers, is there an issue about who gets identified as who gets identified as being uh, Muslim? Yeah. Um, partly because we don't we don't in most of our statistics we don't identify. Them. No, that's right. And, so, and what for is I know in other contexts, I mean, if you you know. People could identify themselves as Christian, and then what, how restrictive they were of certain practices were very dramatically, or the same thing sort of true Jewish. So, so whether you self-identify may be related to your religiosity or something like that. But in complicated, loose ways. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I agree with that. Um, and, and that's our particular problem with the U.S. is we don't really have any large sample data where people are identifying their their religion. Um, but also, probably, sanctions are less severe. Sanctions are less severe I mean, for... You don't have to wear it. I mean, right, the, the law is such that if you don't want to obey, I mean, there's, it's, there's, no, there's no legal that, um, kind of apparatus reinforcing right. whatever the... Right. Right. So, so I get right. So, as you said, in complex ways, you may be more likely to self-report because there are fewer restrictions. But then maybe during pregnancy, you don't. Uh, this way, I think uh, you know the, the proxy we're going to wind up using uh, for our Michigan data are is simply the the country of descent of the parents. Um, the the closest we've come to being able to benchmark that is with the Canadian census, uh, because the Canadian census also asks ancestry and in, I think, certain of the census here, they asked the religion too. And uh, I forget the exact number, but it was something like 85% of those reporting parent descent in these countries reported being uh, Muslim as well. Uh, to the extent that they're not observing, obviously that's going to tend to just bias our uh, findings to zero. If we yeah, it's, a, it's an issue about how you interpret your magnitude. A absolutely. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, it's an issue of how we interpret our magnitude. That's right. Yes. Um, Yes. And, and I mean, where, where that's going to be particularly important, in addition to the issues you mentioned, are sort of compliance by a month of gestation, uh, which we probably think is following as the pregnancy goes on. Uh, but we don't. We don't. So uh, literature review metabolic changes among pregnant women. So this is not, uh, we haven't gotten to, to, to Ramadan in particular yet. This term, accelerated starvation, sort of this scary term, was coined uh, apparently in 1965 in the study of diabetic mothers. Uh, and basically, if you looked at their you know, blood chemistry during pregnancy, they had, they had things going on that looked a lot like someone who was starving, okay? So uh, free fatty acids. Basically, the body's sort of breaking down um, its, its stores. What uh, this 1982 study in the Lancet found, which was, uh, I think, based in Chicago, was that this same accelerated starv starvation pattern is observed uh, in women who are pregnant who skip breakfast. So again, not a Ramadan study, it's just, uh, you know, if you're coming in for a procedure or something like that, and they said, you know, skip breakfast, wacky things went on uh, if you were pregnant that did not go on if you were not pregnant. And that's what this slide from the 
1982 Lancet study uh, indicates here on the x-axis um, are the hours of the fast here. Okay, so basically you'd have dinner the night before, then you'd go to sleep, you come to the hospital uh, at 6 a.m. and they take your uh, take your blood, and check it out, and they do that every two hours until noon. All right. And on the left, we have the non-pregnant population. On the right, we have the pregnant population. Uh, what they found was that the pattern for pregnant and non-pregnant is very different. And if, for example, if you look at free fatty acids, they go wacky for the for the um, for the pregnant women, not for the pregnant uh, non-pregnant women. What they interpret this as is there's this double burden uh, of uh, being pregnant and fasting, and there's a very different response uh, on the mind. Yeah. How far along were the pregnancies? These 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 were later. These pregnancies were later on. Yes. Yeah. So so yes, we need to. Uh, they they were not uh, certainly you know first month or two. That's right. Then sort of the obvious thing to do you know after that study in 1982 is see if the same thing is going on with Ramadan fasting and that's basically exactly what these small sample studies did, is that they looked at uh, uh, the same mom who was fasting uh, for Ramadan and not fasting for Ramadan. They found these very, um, these very similar patterns, uh, and uh, as a result, uh, you know, their recommendations to uh, take up the dispensation uh, during Ramadan were possible. Yes? I don't know if we can come back to a situation where you're accepted from fasting. Okay. It's not the case that women are automatically exempted. That's, and, and moreover, I mean, they're reporting clients. The practice that. always arises, but when you talk to Islamic scholars, they say that um, the pregnant woman is considered to be in, in a special circumstance, in a special situation, and this is a medical situation. So, so she's accepted from fasting. So, I, I guess that might be also included. So okay, I, I will defer to you on, on on that. I mean, they do report fasting, so they're out of compliance with that. When when they do do surveys of them, they say, you know, by and large they are fasting. Furthermore, uh, if you're, where we're going to find the the lion's share of our effects are very early in pregnancy when women wouldn't know they're pregnant in any event. I mean, generally the revelation says there's no burden on you, so um, of course practices change. People might people might be so sensitive and they might be thinking that if they fast. In this even difficult situation, they might be rewarded more, more. So this might be the basic logic. But then again, I mean, Quran doesn't you know say that you have to fast when you're pregnant. Just, just, just the opposite. If you, if this is going to be burden on you, then you simply accept it. I've, I've seen that interpretation as well. That if, if the mother feels like it's going to be a burden for her, then she should request a lot of people are doing that actually when they're pregnant. Okay. Well, they don't. They, they just take advantage of it. Okay, but they, they don't they don't report doing that. When, when you service. Service. And the other thing here is, um, you know, again, the same page, please. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It's forbidden for a woman to fast if she is menstrual bleeding, as is interfered with ritual purity and cleanliness. Actually, um, in Quran, that is not the case. I mean, menstruation is considered to be a medical condition. It's not like ritual, it, it has nothing to do with ritual purity. Okay, that, that is, that's that simply the, the director of the American Society for Muslim Advancement. Like but in Quran, I mean, the definition is so over. It says, um, they ask about mens menstruation. Okay. And this is the ayah. It says, menstruation is a medical condition. So when women are menstruating, abstain from them, just look them along, because this is a medical condition. So it doesn't say anything related to um, purity, cleanliness. Even in the hadith, it doesn't say anything regarding that. 
Okay, so it's just a medical condition, no other condition. Okay, so, so basically you're saying there's an exemption for menstruating, but it's not about cleanliness, it's about... It's nothing to do with cleanliness or ritual purity, or purity okay. for that matter. Okay. I mean, the revelation is so clear, it's, it's not subject to interpretation. Someone's interpreted it differently. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you ask what they'll see Okay, so maybe we can talk more about it uh, later, but would you agree with me on the first month of pregnancy, if you don't know you're pregnant, then you can't do anything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fetal health. Um, fetal health is nice to look at in the sense that you can do the same mother in and out of the fasting state. Uh, and so you can take that difference and not worry so much about uh, selection if you're deciding to fast or not. Um, the downside is there aren't really standardized measures of fetal health, you know, prior to birth outcomes. So people have looked at things like glucose levels, diminished fetal breathing movements, uh, etc., and finding that basically uh, the the amount of fetal activity changes in and out of the fast state. Whether that maps to other stuff um, hasn't gotten very far. Birth outcomes present a sort of more of a challenge in that uh, we can't easily compare. Uh, mothers for this, uh, sorry, uh, outcomes for the same mother in and out of the fasting state, uh, unless we're blessed with um, uh, siblings data, which we actually recently were, and, and it doesn't really change much. Uh, but in, in any event, what, what people have done uh, prior to, to, um, to now is uh, basically compare mothers who reported fasting during pregnancy to mothers who reported not fasting during pregnancy. Uh, and uh, there's also sort of uh, baseline differences in the average characteristics of those women who reported fasting and those who reported not fasting, including things like BMI, which we think are also going to show up as differences in uh, birth outcomes. Do you know, well, I mean, this is just being mean about medical studies. They're small samples. Um, but, and, and something that's nice about, you know, non-Uganda and other places on the equator is that you can also use the variation in the number of uh, daylight hours. Uh, and uh, that's something we'll be able to do uh, as well. And I mean, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip uh, non Ramadan studies um, and uh, stop beating up on medical studies. Okay. Uh, Long term effects, uh, there are, ours is the first study of, of sort of like adult health effects of, um, of Ramadan exposure that we've been able to find. Um, there's reason to believe from controlled studies as, you know, of animals uh, that some of the um, mechanisms at play in those fetal origin studies may uh, show up here as well. So uh, ketone exposure, early ingestation appears in neurological development in rats. So if you sort of like the rat parallel, then you might be worried about that. Um, uh, and more generally, uh, fetal origin literature uh, links um, nutrition, especially in early gestation, to uh, later life um, health and cognitive outcomes. If you look at the 1944-45 uh, Dutch families many people have, um, people have looked at um, uh, basically uh, things like schizophrenia, uh, uh, self-reported health, heart disease, that sort of thing. These things tend to show up with early gestation exposure to the family. And interestingly, that's a little bit different from where you see the, most of the birth weight effects would seem to be more um, later gestation. Uh, but uh, these, uh, these, these things may lead us to believe uh, which I'll say actually in a second, which is that because compliance is likely higher early pregnancy, and the fact that you know if you have to pick probably early pregnancy is, is maybe more important for these longer effects, um, that we may find long, larger effects for early pregnancy. So the other long-term study uh, seen in this uh, study of 191 mothers in um, in Iran uh, that looked at IQ uh, in age five is sort of is subject to the usual concerns about the comparison of those who just reported fasting versus those who reported uh, not fasting. We don't know anything about selection into those uh, two groups. Uh, subsequent to our study, there's this paper um, by uh, Ryan Van Hewitt, who's looking at IFS, um, and uh, basically uh, finds coronary heart disease, kidney disease, and type 2 diabetes are higher with um, uh, prenatal Ramadan exposure, and this thing persists with maternal fixed effects, which is a nice feature of these IFLS data. Okay, so the general hypothesis that I've sort of hinted at strongly is that we're going to have worse health outcomes for those who are in utero during Ramadan, um, and uh, exposure in early pregnancy might be worse 
uh, because women don't know they're pregnant, uh, and uh, various things are happening uh, in early pregnancy that would be susceptible to disruptions in early pregnancy. And if you ask Peter Gluckman, who's the guy in the fetal matrix book, we asked him about our paper, and he said, my own bias greater lung effects for early gestation, but that's only my mind. Okay, so the data we're going to look at are the Michigan natality files. Uh, Michigan's, uh, by some counts, the second largest U.S. Arab population. Uh, evidence of high rates of fasting during Ramadan um, from surveys. We also have this nice feature of variation daylight hours. Uh, what we have are the uh, universal births in Michigan in 1995. Uh, Ramadan ran from April 1989 to October in 2005. Uh, what that means is that the length of the fast uh, varied from 9 to 15 hours. Um, we know, uh, not religion, what we know is the, the parents' ancestry, ancestry um, which is obviously going to be a proxy for, uh, for whether they're uh, Muslim. Um, and we have the issue of um, uh, many Arabs being Christian. Uh, that would tend to understate our results. Um, and what we can do to try and get at that is use the census data and zip codes to drop um, places where there are uh, colleagues uh, from the sample. We're going to focus on birth weight, uh, in part because lots of people do. Uh, it's, it's a commonly used marker for, for, um, for uh, health at birth in the fetal origins literature. Uh, you can also, if, you, if you're not a big fan of birth weight, you could also sort of think of it as um, a test for the plausibility of effects of uh, fasting. So does there seem to be uh, movements in birth weight that would seem consistent with, with fasting? Um, we have other measures available, uh, things like whether they went to a NICU and that sort of thing. These guys, these are going to have low incidence rates, so we're not going to have a lot of power. Um, and we'll do, you know, spec checks using the non arrows to see if there's some really funky seasonality going on, which we also observe among the uh, non arabs that suggest that what we're picking up with the um, with the Arab population is not a uh, treatment effect. Yes? Your zip codes of the, uh, the natality files? Say again? You have the zip codes of the natality files? So in order to exclude the uh, zip codes with the county. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we don't have the, yeah, obviously, calcium from the from the okay. right? Um. <coughs> Could you explain the exclude non-white mothers? Uh, yeah, we, we, we did that just as a homogeneous comparison group, but whether we do that or not doesn't make a big difference to our results. But, so yeah. what are the race categories of why? So there, uh, so on the birth certificate, there's sort of the usual, same as in the national. There's, um, there's, there's white, uh, black, various um, Asian groups, and then in more recent years, they're identifying Hispanic as well. Okay. So we we dropped uh, we dropped uh, basically anyone who is not white. Somebody who was black, who yeah. was black, or white, yeah. Asian. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Are there, I mean, we, we, yeah, we want to. Yeah. Are there things that you can do during non-fasting hours, like eating more frequently or more nutritious foods to kind of compensate for, you know, things like? I, I don't really know. I think the main thing you would do is you uh, is to is to eat right before dawn. Because I mean, not eating for nine hours every time a woman does that, right? So it's just that. It, right. It just yeah, so, coincides with sleeping. Right? That's right. So, Yes. So yes. So the, right. And I, and I didn't mention this in the background, but the the stuff on like hy hypoglycemia and this sort of thing uh, indicates that the fast that occurs during daylight hours has okay. has a quicker response than that occurs during during nighttime hours. Um, yeah. Yep. I saw this paper a while ago that actually said since I can't track it down top of my head, can't bring it up, but. Uh, they said that during Ramadan, you actually found spending on food actually went up in families. Yep. And so I'm wondering if there's this issue of the composition of what people are eating and how that plays a role uh, in this. Yes. So uh, I don't know that study, but I will say that I know of at least one study that finds that the, with that was looking at the number of calories consumed during Ramadan. Most of them find a decrease in the number of calories. Some, one study from Morocco, I think. Found an increase in the number of calories. So, so definitely, there, there, there. I mean, the um, the sort of the, the meal that, that occurs at the at, at is sort of like a feast and this sort of thing. So that um, it's it's not obvious uh, sort of ex ante that, that calories would go down or that spending would go down or anything like that. What I think we have uh, a more 
sort of um, clear experiment in is just the timing of nutrition rather than sort of the gross amount of it. Yeah. But oh. doesn't that question, you're interpreting your results as a fast I, result. You're, yeah, you're, I, I know, yes, you're, yes to everything you're about to say. That's one way to say it. So, but I can elaborate on that if you'd like. <laughs> Lots of changes during Ramadan. Is that sort of where we're going? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yes. Uh, so I think the, uh, I think in particular that there are no theories, there are no obvious theories like related to sleep patterns that would say that the sex ratio should change, whereas there are for nutrition. So I think those are more consistent with the nutritional story. But there, there's more than one first stage here. It's not just a nutrition first stage. There's other first stages that we're not. Yeah. So here's um, the uh, Michigan air population by zip code uh, by quartile. So something that was a bit of a surprise to us was that you know it's not all you know right around here. Now that said, you know that's where most people live. So that's where most of the sample is going to be com coming from. But the like the mean uh, the mean fraction arrow. Uh, for the um, for those who are of Arab descent, was something like uh, 0.2 in the zip code. So you know there there there's 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 a good degree of mixing by zip code. Okay, methodology. Uh, I think maybe I'll be a little more comfortable with this. So yeah. sorry. So this this is all coming off of uh, where? You, I'm sorry. This where they, where no. is the Arab birth certificate? It's coming off the birth certificate. So that's actually why we're in Michigan. Uh, is because the national data don't have the ancestry info, but the Michigan natality data has the ancestry info, which is not there otherwise. How is it what country of birth of the parents? It's no, it's it's um, it's uh, you know whether they were born in the U.S. or not. That's true, but you don't know which specific country the uh, you know parents or whatever were born in. What it asks is uh, where. What's your country of descent? In California, if I mean, I've, I've tried, I've tried to sort of pursue this in both New York and California without success. Uh, California, I don't think they asked the descent question, and the, the there's a little bit more detail on the country of birth than there is nationally. What they they do have that people have used in California that I think would be great um, is is you actually can get the last name. So you could do stuff with the last name there, but that would be a whole higher sort of thing. Yeah. And and New York, I tried to get the New York data because they do the descent thing as well, um, and that was just DOA at the IRB, so anyway. All right. Uh, yes, you tell me. I'm confused. You don't have to go to Columbia IRB regardless? Do I have to go to Columbia IRB regardless? Yes, I did. Oh, so the issue No, it wasn't. Columbia IRB didn't kill it. New York City Department okay. of Mental you Health and Hygiene killed it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that was actually, I mean, sorry. I can't say that. <laughs> I'm going to just keep uh, we're going to measures of exposure for each day between 1980 and 2005, uh, and we're going to match back to the first day uh, uh, of each of the 30 day periods uh, prior to the birth. So basically, we're going to count back from the date of birth and assign Ramadan exposure measures for each month of pregnancy. Um, and we can do that coming backwards, or we can sort of put faith in the um, gestation length measures and count forward from the estimated date of conception. It doesn't turn out to matter very much um, which way we do it. Then we can sort of warm up to situations where we don't have the exact date of birth, throw out the information on the exact date of birth, and, and work off of the month of birth instead, um, which is going to be our situation in, excuse me, uh, Uganda, uh, uh, Iraq. Okay, so this is 1989, and Ramadan was from April 7th to May 6th, and so uh, w what we would have for our exposure in the first month of pregnancy uh, measure would be a triangle like this that's maximized on the first day of Ramadan um, and then falls to either side, okay? So basically, um, we're gonna do this for each month. What we're also gonna do is scale this by the fraction of the solstice uh, hours. So, you know, if this were a winter Ramadan, then we'd have a triangle that only went up that high. Uh, because we're getting pretty close to the solstice here, we have pretty much all the solstice. Um, hours of, uh, of fasting. So we're going to do this for, for all the um, adjacent uh, months. So exposure in the second month of pregnancy 
uh, would be maximized for uh, a conception out here. Okay? If you want to know where my high school prom was, it's right around there. So, um, okay, so the methodology is really straightforward. What we're going to do is basically regress uh, birth outcomes on a bunch of dummies, uh, year, month, some, uh, some geographic dummies. And then the, the key thing here is we're going to have these um, exposure measures for each of the nine months of pregnancy. Okay? Uh, and so the comparison here is uh, births uh, that had um, exposure to Roundup uh, right afterwards, so uh, implicitly no exposure, to those that had it at, at these uh, nine months of pregnancy. Um, and then we're going to throw in controls for the various things that are you know, well recorded on the birth certificate that we think might also affect uh, birth outcomes or we, we know affect birth outcomes, maternal education and age and that sort of thing. A nice thing, sort of early indication that we have a, 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 a clean design here is whether we control for this, uh, you know, these other determinants of birth outcomes, that doesn't affect our, uh, our coefficients for uh, the, the, the treatment of interest. Um, and we'll run them separately for the Arab population uh, from the non-Arab population. Uh, so we're doing this within Arab comparison, basically. Okay, so uh, this is probably overkill at this point, but we're not relying on the assumption that fasters and non-fasters are comparable at a point in time. Um, what we're doing instead is using the differences in timing of um, Raman across different cohorts, uh, the identifying assumptions, the amount of correlation between potential outcomes and the timing of conceptions relative to uh, Raman. Uh, so, uh, you know, this could be violated if uh, you know, there's selection who gets pregnant just prior to Ramadan. Uh, furthermore, uh, you know, we're not observing fasting behavior. Uh, so what we have here is we have an instrument that's the timing, and we have our birth outcomes, and we don't get to observe the treatment behind, okay? Uh, someday, I think we may be able to do like two, uh, the two sample IV or something like this to um, have a better way to interpret our intent to treat estimates, which is what this is going to be. But we don't have that now. Okay, so now, uh, with about 10 minutes ago, I, I, I have beta. And um, so, so what we have here are, you know, about 45,000 uh, Arab uh, births in Michigan, um, and uh, non-Arabs over on the right. Things to notice are uh, basically the SES on average is a little bit uh, lower. So if you look at uh, maternal education, you have 12 years of schooling for, for Arab moms and 13 for non-Arab moms. Uh, and uh, if you look at Medicaid, 46% uh, for Arab moms and 27% non-Arab moms. Uh, that said, if you look at the uh, sort of just gross measures of health at birth, you know, these SES differences don't immediately register. So like uh, low birth weights, 4% versus 5% for non-Arabs, uh, similarly low levels of infant death. So uh, basically lower SES, but not so obviously uh, different uh, mean health outcomes. Okay, so here's my first um, results figure. Uh, what we have this is a little bit involved, so I'll, I'll talk about this real quick. Uh, what we have right here are the months prior to birth. So this is uh, uh, pregnancies that are exposed to Ramadan one month prior to birth, and this is going back nine months uh, prior to birth. And what the dependent variable is uh, birth weight. What we what we find with this uh, in the first or second column is about a 40 gram reduction in mean birth weight when Ramadan falls uh, nine months prior to birth, uh, and similar uh, eight months prior, and sort of some hit or miss effects, effects sort of in the pregnancy. One sort of thing we might be concerned about, sort of on the road to thinking about people timing pregnancies, perhaps, is. If we looked at the um, uh, the uh, births that had Ramadan fall 10 months prior to them, these did not overlap, uh, did not have Ramadan overlapping with the pregnancy. So if we found another negative 40 here, we'd be a little bit worried that uh, you know we're picking up something else. It drops off nicely here, so 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 that makes us happy. Um, furthermore, when we go from column two to column three, what we do is we throw out the information um, on the hours of daylight. And we just use uh, uh, basically um, treating everything like the same uh, length in terms of hours, and we get an attenuation of the effects. So basically, if we introduce measurement error in our treatment variable, you know, we get what we're supposed It's to not classical measurement It's not classical. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, so who knows if it's supposed to attenuate? Maybe it's supposed to go up. Um, yeah, it's not classical. Um, 
Okay, so uh, when we change this treatment to be counting backwards, uh, instead of counting backwards, if we count forwards, uh, the pattern of the effects is pretty similar. Uh, we lose about 10% of the sample, but it seems to be that first month. You, you mean not forwards, but counting their, their notional conception data. Say again? You don't mean counting forwards the same data. You're, you mean using the conception data. Yeah. Reported conception Still way backwards. So you're, sure. using the, you're using the reported yeah, sure, 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 yeah, we're, we're, we're yes, we count the same direction from different data. Just a quick question on the magnitude of this coefficient. Small. In, in, in interpretation, I think that, that the coefficient is per unit change in the independent variable, which is defined exactly how here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. It's the fraction, it's the, um, one unit change would be to, I think, a, a full a full solstice of Rama, maximal Rama exposure. Right. So that, that is like in, in practice the actual variation. Yes. In practice, in, pra in practice, uh, yeah. So I mean, I guess you can sort of get it from throwing out the hours information to sort of do that. But yes, um, in, in practice, it's less than that. That's right. Okay. Uh, similar uh, pattern for the timing of effects. And when we uh, do this instead for the non-Arabs, we'd be really, you know, upset if we found some of the things we don't. We find, um, you know, small magnitudes uh, less than the the size. Now, I'm, what I what I want to have a little bit is this uh, sex ratio thing. Um, so there's a there's a uh, hypothesis from evolutionary biology called the Trevor's Wheeler hypothesis that basically the sex ratio should be endogenous and depend on the condition of the mother. Uh, there's a lot of um, evidence of this from sort of mammal studies. Um, you can also see it in famine studies, like with the Dutch famine and with the uh, China famine, the sex ratio goes female, um, uh, you know, during the famine. Uh, there's a study in 2008. Is, is, there, is the idea, is there Trevor's idea that it's a natural selection story that we're expendable? Mm -hmm. And are expendable. So, so, because, so we, because you can still, the species would survive Relatively if you're going to have a, if you're going to have a weak, under-resourced child, better to have a female because it's, you're likely to actually get a get offspring that way. A weak, under-resourced male is very unlikely to reproduce. That's, that's sort of the idea. Yeah. So the reproductive success <laughs> of 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 males is is sort of more tightly linked to the um, sort of the resource environment. So like because uh, because uh, if, 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 if you're a male doing well, you can um, have a whole slew of kids. Whereas if you're a female doing really well, you can only have so many kids because you're constrained by this sort of uh, that biology stuff. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, 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 it's that. Okay. Um, you, from this uh, study from the um, Proceedings of Royal Society of Biological Science in 2008, nutrition around the time of conception is most important. This is just a, a cross-sectional uh, study. But uh, sort of, they got a lot of play in the press. You are what your mother eats. Evidence of maternal food consumption diet influencing fetal sex ratio uh, in humans. Uh, what they found was that um, when you measure, you know, just cross-sectionally, uh, nutrition at different stages of pregnancy and pre-pregnancy, <coughs> that the the timing of conception, the timing of um, of uh, nutrition relative to um, uh, conception matters both. It's right around the time of conception, and this is quite consistent with the mammal studies. That found that basically, the, among various things like you know, partnership status. Although I don't think I think they were considering that, but basically the various um, uh, modifiers of the sex ratio, nutrition is the most important, and furthermore, that around the time of conception is, is sort of the most important thing. Uh, also, something to note here is these, you know, in the sex ratio world, it, these are huge effects. If you get a sex ratio down to you know from 51 to 45 percent, that's 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 like that's you're really going up. So. Uh, what do we find? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, basically look at the fraction of the um, uh, cohort that's male. Uh, and what we find when we do that is uh, we find roughly similar effects that there's a 0 0.037 uh, decrease in the sex ratio uh, for all uh, Arab, uh, all Arabs in the sample. We, if we check out the, um, the, the Chaldean zip code, then we get up to around minus 0.066. What well, we did in these. Um, uh, are sort of, you know, do as best as we can to think a little bit about the mechanism. So um, one of the, one of the, um, one of the mechanisms for Trevor's Willard that's been um, posited is basically this male vulnerability thing that males just 
or good at dying off, um, which is true sort of empirically. You know, males die more sort of at every age than, than, than women. Um, and that's true in utero as well. Uh, so basically, the male's conceived, but then uh, when, when the situation's rough, they, they, um, they, they vanish. Uh, and that's what we see here, is that uh, when we look at the number of, uh, of uh, people born with for, uh, exposure to Ramadan uh, in the first month, it's, it's coming out of missing males. We don't see anything in terms of females. So what it looks like is the cohort's smaller, but it's only smaller in terms of males, okay? So that's a suggestion of this selective attrition and male vulnerability thing. Okay. Um, and this uh, mechanism for this, uh, I think, maps back to what Matthews and all were, were talking about, is that uh, skipping breakfast extends the normal period and that kind of fasting, depressing circulating glucose levels, and may be interpreted as the body as indicative of poor environmental conditions. We saw from the um, from the um, accelerated starvation studies that uh, you know fasting uh, for Rama definitely does lower glucose levels. So if this if this mechanism that they that they're um, uh, putting stock in is at play, then it makes very uh, much sense that we're finding effects of the same period with a, a relatively similar treatment. Okay. So now the identifying assumption we concerned about what would be if observables or unobservables, but now we're going to get to say much about that, are correlated with the timing of um, Ramadan exposure. So um, I've alluded to this a couple of times. I'm going to sort of skip ahead um, uh, just to show you this slide here. We use sort of the various uh, uh, SES and health measures on the uh, birth certificate and just run these as dependent variables, a falsification check. If we saw these things, you know, lighting up uh, a lot, we'd be worried. Uh, where they do light up, the, the, the magnitudes are, are are really quite small. So the fact that when we controlled for these things, it didn't really change anything in terms of our point estimates, you know, this is quite consistent with the fact that we don't see anything in this, in this uh, exercise. So uh, to summarize the birth outcomes, this is why I wanted to get to F, you know, two, and then like people, I guess, might dribble away, but, but then I'll go to Uganda. Uh, so uh, we find statistically significant effects around our exposure uh, for mean birth weight. It's a, it's a modest, maybe that's, maybe that's a little bit generous, uh, modest effect sizes are small. Uh, it, furthermore, something that I haven't said, but it's not concentrated at the bottom of birth weight distribution either. So, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, studies find that the relationship between birth weight and other measures of health is pretty nonlinear. Uh, so, movements at the bottom of distribution matter more for you know other measures than you know movements around mean. Uh, and we're not finding like kicking out in the tail of the bottom of birth weight distribution, which would maybe get us a little bit more excited about this birth weight result. Um, we also detect, but I don't think I showed you, and, uh, and I'm not going to, uh, small effects on gestation like that are significant. Um, however, they're, they're sort of of a magnitude that it seems to be this birth weight effect is, effect is mostly IUGR, so inter, intrauterine growth retardation, not you know just movements in gestation like. Uh, and so you know if, if if you don't get too excited about birth weight, uh, then it suggests at least that we're seeing this first stage effect of Ramadan on. In terms of the fraction male, well, I just showed you this. Um, you know, it's it's a, it's from 52 to 46 uh, percent, uh, and it, it doesn't preclude other stages, as I mentioned before. Okay, now on to. Maybe we should take a break here and let yes. people leave. We need to. Yes. So thanks very much. Okay.